Um, I don't know if I've got enough chicken in my teeth. I'm going to just sit here and pick it out the whole night. I actually tried to find, and I did find, but because it is her birthday month, the queen picking her nose, I didn't think it would be appropriate for tonight. <laughs> she gets caught all the time doing something terrible. So my intention is to talk about disgust as an element of survival. Without disgust, we can't thrive. All right. So um, I'm one of the educators here. Um, I have all my bosses around me. I've got so many bosses around me tonight. And um, we deal with community transformation. And our intention as registered counselors is to start with grassroots transformation and not top down. So in actual fact, we are just the catalysts because we are nothing in the community. The community is the 98%. If we're going to talk numbers, we're going to talk 98% to 2%. So all we are here is to just shake up the waters, create the connections, work the collaboration, but your community is the solution. Exactly as Brent mentioned earlier, I'm not great at maths, so I can't work out the percentages that he was tossing around, but it is that reversal. The community speaks, therefore we is. Um, is it, which way does it go? <coughs> it's on. Am I pointing at the wrong thing? Oh, I thought I had to point at the machine. Okay. All right, so my interest, uh, I'm also studying. We're all studying, we're all eternal learners. So um, my PhD is to do with hate crimes, why we are hated, why we are maligned, why we are marginalized, why are we isolated, why are we pariahs, why don't people love us? You know, what's it about us um, that, that makes us someone to avoid? And it deals with the principles of love. What is the degree of intimacy I want to have with you? How close do I want to be with you? And we're not talking about sexual love or lust love or any of those things. But if I am repelled and repulsed and I have contempt from you, there's no way I want you near me. Mm. The second one is how much passion is involved in that element? How much passion makes me want to come in and really be engaged with you and really be expressive and really song and dance with you? And finally, how much of that relationship do I want to commit to? So the cooler I am with all of those intimacy, passion, and commitment, the less I respect you. So one of the things as a marital counselor running a practice is that when I watch the, the type of interaction that happens between couples, it's not the quietness that goes down. It's the degree of the curled lip, the contempt, <coughs> and the no respect for the other that makes it understandable. When we are disgusted, there's a galvanic, visceral response from our brain to our stomachs, and everything that we know about love and nurturing and food and everything like that comes through our mouths. So it's only okay that when we are disgusted with something, that it is our mouths that demonstrate that. You find this with politicians. We only have to look at someone like Donald Trump and study his mouth to understand, never mind what comes out of it, to understand exactly how he feels about that person. Right, if you want to live, you must be disgusted because disgust is the prophylactic. Disgust is that thing that will save you from eating food that's off, food that's slimy, Food that is alive and wiggling down you. <laughs> What's that fear factor thing? <laughs> you know those those duck eggs, this size, like an ostrich egg, that you must eat thirty-five of them to win. Yes. Right. So it goes to eventually xenophobia and hate crime from that factor of disgust, that degree of contempt you have for the other, that lack of respect that you have for the other. The fundamentals of any collaboration for our general mental health, if we don't have it for the other, it leads to xenophobia. It leads to genocide. It leads to hate crimes, the alienation, the isolation, the revulsion, 
It's an early warning system. We thank God that we got disgust. Imagine if you didn't. Imagine if you couldn't smell that, that food that was a contagion to you. We have famous people in here. I don't remember this. Actors. What's his name? Ross. Yeah. But there we are. That grimace. That stuff that makes you nauseous. The nose wrinkling. You can't fake it. It is so instantaneous. It tells the world exactly how you feel. Vomit. And it goes right back to the ancient Greeks. So even when they had to wear the masks and say what they had to say and have the chorus of women weeping on the one side, you really got through to the various emotions. And disgust is an emotion. Disgust is one of the few emotions that keeps you alive. In early art, Hieronymus Bosch, you have got, this is, comes from a crucifixion scene, by the way, a religious crucifixion scene in which hell, damnation, and other lusty things are happening here. That's a very difficult thing to ride. And different, <laughs> different things done by women to men. Things that we shouldn't be looking at, really. So this was a narrative that would tell you what hell on earth would be if you did this, this, and this. So we learned by images. Grunewald, also an early Renaissance Germanic painter, the greater the number of holes and desecration of the human being, the body, and the rot of the Jesus figure, the greater amount, the more we were disgusted in order to revolt against those who come to harm us. You understand that? So you'll find in terrorist groups, you'll find in child soldiers, you'll find where they abuse people to blow themselves up, they generate that amount of anger and fear in you by showing you what will affect you to become the martyr. Do you understand that? Any questions? Good. Right. <laughs> I just need to show you. This is not, are you all over 18 years of age? Okay. This is Goya, Francisco Goya, with the war against France in Spain, the atrocities of the French against the Spaniards, he was the main recorder. So these are called the disasters of war. These are not things that are pleasant, but these are things that happen in war. The emasculation, the beheadings, the amputations, all of these are when you are alive, because you must suffer. And so these images went around Spain for, to embolden and empower and make sure that those who needed to have a reason to fight the French would get on and do it. And this is how we build up. This is Salvador Dali on the civil war in Spain. Spain has got a problem. There's so many artists, including Picasso. But whatever we do that has got rot and deceased muscles there and anything that leaks or is slimy or is representing that which is grotesque this is mother Spain tearing herself apart in civil strife so the more revolting we can make it and the more sexually explicit of the nurturing that is now being torn from the main plant. This sort of image is the image that galvanizes passions. This is a work of art. This is a jewelry piece using teeth, real teeth. Because it's slimy, because it's using human parts, it becomes disgusting. Right, you've all read the book, Eat, Pray, Love. Now, we don't want to go into the way in which you make love to someone. And we don't want to experiment or explore your private life. So I'm going to go via the animal roots. Oh. Bear gorillas, how to survive. Okay. Eat it raw, eat it fresh. If you want to be my sexual partner, I'm going to show you what I've got. <laughs> And I'm going to flaunt it, and I'm going to blow it up 
so that you can really see it from 300 meters. And I'm going to make it red. And I am going to be so seductive. <laughs> I'm going to go in any which way I can quickly. So if it's the anus, I'm in. There are certain snakes out there who don't have to poison you. They just have to spit out the slimy, gelatinous thing to make sure that you don't want to hold it. Although that man seems quite keen. There are certain foods we can't tolerate because they are slimy. So fuck. I mean, would you serve them to your dog? Canned chicken. I didn't even know these things existed. <laughs> oh, the chicken, how big is that tin? <laughs> you know the fear factor story when you have to run through Thailand and you have to eat little goslings in shells? What is more disgusting, the fact that you have to eat it or the filthy nails? <laughs> and other delicacies. And this I didn't even know. So not only are you eating something that's slimy and grey, which is not a food colour, it's alive. Sorry, Jackie. Are you able to concentrate or are you busy vomiting in the corner? <laughs> You're right. <laughs> are you covering it with your scarf, your nostrils as well? It's amazing what you can smell when you watch us, huh? <laughs> okay, so these are the things they terrify us, but they're microscopic, you can barely see them. That's what's in your bed, one of gazillions, your bed bugs. Isn't it gorgeous? <laughs> this thing lives on our shed skin. If you ever get very, very ill and you have to get an ambulance, don't ever get into an ambulance. Because when you're in an ambulance, the shed skin from the previous persons before you is in the air and is landing on you. So when you land up in the ICU or the high care, they have to take body swaps of you. The first question they say to you is, how did you come into the hospital? By ambulance, oh my God, everyone rears back. Masks on. Okay. And it doesn't matter for those of you who are Jewish, if it's Hatsola. Ambulances are conveyors of disease. And that's what's in your bed. When you nestle up and you cuddle up and you <coughs> coochie coochie coo, they also coochie coochie coo. In your <laughs> and this is what we have in South Africa. It's called a great African snail. Notice the size. The scale is the size of a hand. And that's what you enjoy eating, I think. So then we've got a couple of things that people like doing. So you're sitting next to this in a plane ride for eight hours, looking at this man's fingers and wondering what he, where he's got them, what he's done with them, how he's scrub his nails, and he's eating with his fingers. And that is maybe the cabin steward, who didn't wash his hands off to go to the toilet. This is hair that was once Rastafarian. And then oh lost. no! Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like an elephant stung. As a thing of beauty, yeah. as a thing of beauty, notice the sexual posing, the <laughs> thing that will absolutely draw you to this person, <laughs> and make sure that you want to live with him forever, yes. ever, or man. <laughs> so, for religious reasons, for spiritual reasons, for shamanic reasons, we will do amazing things to our body and enjoy it. Uh, we will also do the amazing things to our body that we don't do or should do and enjoy it. Now there are some people who are drawn to bodily hair all over. <laughs> I need the camera here. Where are you? Where are you? Look, this man is ready to vomit. <laughs> He's covered his face the entire presentation. <laughs> Oh, good, look at that. And we're not even in America. Well, that's quite often. And then something like this. What a message. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at the car, bro. So there the are tire. many ways that we can communicate our private lives. And that's the problem. We are revulsed. We are repelled. We are... 
but, but we can't stop looking. It has a draw card to it. It's bizarre. This man here is Jonathan Haidt, H-A-R-D-T. He talks about, he can tell by your degree of nausea and your degree of disgust, he can tell exactly whether you will be a Democrat or a Republican. <laughs> I don't have all the answers because I don't live in America, but it's quite interesting. But he does talk about how we are divided between politics and religion, and those are the other areas for us to be enraged when things don't go our way, when religion doesn't work for us, or someone else doesn't respect our religion, or for that matter, political minds and how we problem solve. And this is a beautiful, beautiful image here. There's a rider on an Indian elephant. Wow. How magnificent. I wonder how long the photographer had to stay underwater to get there. But what this principle is here is left brain up there, sorry Brent, left brain, which is logical and cold and neutral and calculated and digital and an analytical and everything that is reasonable and pragmatic. And what is underneath, like an igloo, not an igloo, uh, an iceberg, is the whole elephant that is passionate and expressive, and wild, and loves to tap dance, and is the creative soul of the total element here. And this total element working together, not the tail wagging the dog, but the driver driving the elephant, is his hypothesis for happiness. And so there you have an expansion of that idea. So here you have the rider, which is the conscious, the verbal, the thinking brain, which is the left brain, highly intellectual, analytical, pragmatic, reasonable. And I'm glad that that little arrow is not further down over there. But the elephant, the automatic, the emotional, the visceral, the brain, i.e. the right brain. So he talks about it, that it's a whole theory, but just to make you aware of, he has a formula for happiness. Uh, where H represents the overall level of happiness that we would try in a relative way to attain a biological set point. How do we start in our world? Like uh, that young man over there who spoke before me um, who mentioned uh, um, nurture and nature. What are the conditions for our popping out and where are we set forth from? And life conditions, as we go along, what shapes and defines us. And finally, how much of our time in our lives do we give out? How much do we volunteer? How much do we do pro bono? Without that, you haven't found happiness. This particular one over here is by a man. Yeah. Oh, seriously? The time is up. Okay, okay, okay. Innovation, using old wisdom. I'm just going to end on this, using old wisdom for contemporary medicine. So using something that has worked, leeches, oh. to help repair the damage of an individual. Moral disgust would have discussed the ethical, the ethical reasoning with disgust that calls for social retribution, that calls for a different way of thinking, critical thinking, legal thinking, that makes you if you have a thing. Thank you so much.